Jim Barsamian. Uh, you just completed a surgical procedure either under my care or my partner's care, Dr. John Landis. This presentation is simply to review the written post-op instruction sheet that you either got at the consultation appointment or at today's uh, recovery period uh, following your surgery. We feel a verbal review of this helps the patient or the caregiver understand what needs to be done over the next five to seven days while you're in recovery from your oral surgical procedure. So I'm gonna review this post-operative information in order of what you have on your sheet so you can follow and take notes as you feel necessary. Day one of the surgery. The most important thing that we always stress with our patients is the placement of the gauze over the surgical sites or site to help allow proper hemostasis or blood control from the surgical field. We most often will use suturing, whether it's dissolvable or non-dissolvable, to also assist in that uh, bleeding issue. However, there still is going to be some oozing that we need to control, and the best way to do that is the placement of gauze postoperatively the first hour or two. The gauze that we're going to give you uh, in your packet of post-op materials will be a 3 by 3 gauze that I encourage you to fold it in half, quarter, and then eighth. And in that form, you place it right over the surgical site and bite down to give firm pressure. It should be replaced about every 15 to 20 minutes or as it gets saturated. And if you have more than one surgical site, you have to do it bilaterally and do it at the same time. We will give enough gauze to hopefully allow that to occur uh, without having to run out to the pharmacy and get more gauze. If so, the pharmacy or local uh, Targets or Kmarts will have also the same type of gauze. The normal clotting time is one to two hours. So you'll be replacing these about every, oh, three, uh, three times per hour, so at least uh, six changes. The exception to the rule is those patients that are on blood thinners. Example, most common blood thinner that most people don't think is a medicine is aspirin. Aspirin, if you take Plavix, a prescription drug, if you take uh, a blood thinner such as Coumadin, you take Xarelto, you take uh, Eliquis, or you take Pradaxia, those are all prescription drugs for anticoagulation, for, for coagulation, uh, uh, or anticoagulant, I'm sorry, and basically we want those patients to usually be controlled by their physician and have that discontinued three to five days prior based on their direction, and they can resume those medicines the following day. But if you are taking those medicines, that one to two hours of clotting time that we're suggesting for the normal patient may be times two. It may take you two to four hours for that bleeding to totally discontinue because of some of the residual effects of those anticoagulants in your system. The next subject is the use of the ice pack or cold compresses. We really encourage the first 24 hours to use that 20 minutes on and then 20 minutes off. If you've had surgery on both sides of the jaw, you can just alternate every 20 minutes. That will help keep the swelling to a minimum. Besides the swelling, uh, you, besides the ice pack, you could also keep the head elevated. We recommend one to two uh, pillows when you rest, so uh, the swelling is going to be more distributed, lower. If you lay down or you lay on one side or the other, expect that side that's more dependent or down at the pillow side to have any more swelling than the other side. That's typical. Another way to help uh, minimize intraoral uh, swelling is sucking on ice chips or crushed ice. However, you do not use that approach until the bleeding has been discontinued and you're not using any more gauze. If you get nauseated, the most common causes of nausea, you're, you're basically swallowing blood. That's the number one cause. So we gotta reevaluate why that's happening. Are you not positioning the gauze correctly? That would be the number one reason why the bleeding is persisting and the blood is going down to your stomach. So that's the first thing I would look at is to reassess whether you're putting in the gauze correctly, because again, you're numb. Sometimes you can't feel where you're putting it, so look at it in, in the bathroom mirror, etc., and place it right over the site and bite down firmly. 
hold it in place for 15 or 20 minutes, and repeat that process until the bleeding stops. If it still persists after an hour, then you may want to resort to using a tea bag, where you moisten a tea bag just under a faucet, spring it out a little bit so it's not real soupy, put it in, bite down on it just like you would with a gauze pack, and that has tannic acid, which is a great astringent and may help also cause the clot to form a little quicker. Even after those techniques, if it still persists, I highly encourage the patient to call the office number. Our answering service will get a hold of either Dr. Landis or myself, and we will then decide what is the next best approach to treating your particular reason for nausea. Medications can also cause nausea, especially on an empty tummy. If that's the case, it's usually occurring after the bleeding is stopped, so the blood is not the issue, but it's a medicine. We may have to change that medicine, or we may even add an anti-nausea medicine to your regimen, which we would have to call in to a pharmacy. That being the case, have a pharmaceutical number available when you do call the service, because we may ask for that. The day after surgery, the most important thing is getting you back onto a normal hygiene and also diet. The normal hygiene for us is I fully expect my patients to start their salt water rinses that second day, no sooner. If you put salt on that wound the first 24 hours, it will burn. So we don't want any rinsing, but as the instruction sheet indicates, please start it with a teaspoon of salt, an eight or 10 ounce lukewarm cup of water. I really encourage the rinsing to be at least done four to five times a day, ideally after each meal. The other thing that can be done for hygiene is be careful about using any water pick, any mechanical toothbrush. Those things should, in the area of where we operated, can disrupt the healing process, cause things to re-bleed or slow down the healing. So avoid those, and we may even give you some specific information the day of the surgery as to what you can or can't do in what part of the mouth with those devices. Again, swelling, it goes hand in hand with any kind of surgery. However, we are giving you medications to help cut back the swelling. Elevating the head always helps. Using the ice the first 24 hours always helps. After that, the ice is not gonna be much help. The next thing would be using warm, moist compresses and put that on the side of the face and actually massage it. It'll help open up vessels and move the fluid out from where it's swollen. That's real good to do, about 20 minutes uh, the instruction says every hour you can do that and alternate it from one side to the other. Uh, I think the most important thing you got to keep in mind, and some of my patients feel when they have surgery they can't do anything with eating. They're almost like they're fasting. Well, we don't want that. We want you just to be uh, cautious about what you are eating in the form of avoid citric acid products, lemonade, orange juice, tomato juice, those kind of things, grapefruit juice. They will burn because of the citric acid. Also, as I mentioned earlier, salt. Salt on an open wound isn't a good thing. It burns. So you don't want to use salt or salty things uh, uh, or salt the food where it becomes an issue the first 24 hours. After that, it's as you feel comfortable. Please consider uh, uh, blending up foods if you need to, whether it's meat, vegetables, fruits. Uh, all that is good to ingest. I will say that you're going to be on a soft diet for the first one to three days. But as you get further into that recovery period, i.e. the five to seven day mark, I really expect most of my patients close to being back to a full diet. The diabetics have to be, be very cautious about their diabetic uh, regimen with their insulin or even their oral medicines. They have to be cautious uh, and may have to even revert to a sliding scale uh, uh, approach if they're taking their insulin. Uh, to assure their sugar levels are properly maintained because there is going to be a slight adjustment on their intake. Those patients may need to eat like a bird. Instead of three basic meals a day, they may have to break them up in five to seven or five to six times a day uh, just to make sure there's enough food in their system to offset the insulin so you don't get hypoglycemic. Again, the following conditions that are not uncommon, these are normal. You can see some swelling, swelling and bruising are two things that are type specific to the complexity of the treatment and more importantly the makeup of the patient. Patients that are uh, light skinned tend to bruise or swell more than patients with a little darker pigmented skin. 
So don't expect uh, swelling to be unusual if you see that or bruising. Sore throat, earache, trismus. Trismus is more uh, tightness of the jaw, muscles sometimes spasm, tighten up a little bit so your jaw doesn't open as much early on and as you get back to functioning with it, it uh, gradually loosens up and gets back to normal. Numbness. Numbness can occur in the areas of the surgical incision uh, or sometimes where the nerve runs in proximity to some of the extractions in the lower jaw. These things generally resolve. We usually go over this information with you preoperatively at the consultation appointment and give the patient an indication of what likelihood you're going to have of any kind of postoperative paresthesia or numbness. Uh, generally, it is not a high percentage. In most cases, 1% to 2% at the best. If you have any questions on any of these areas of concern or actually normal conditions that occur post-op, please call the office and Dr. Landis or I will try to allay your fears as to what you're concerned about. Other general information. Females that are on birth control pills have to be very cautious because when they're being given an antibiotic after a procedure, the antibiotic makes that birth control less effective. So we don't want you to uh, assume that you are properly protected by your birth control pill. Use other devices uh, so you don't have any surprises nine months later. Patients that are smokers, please discontinue the smoking two to three days after the surgery. This is only for your well-being. People that are smokers tend to develop dry sockets more than any other patient. And a dry socket is an ostitis or inflammation of the bone that is refractory to any narcotic. In other words, the pain medication that we give you was working fine for pain relief the first three to five days. All of a sudden, you start having pain in the lower jaw primarily. Very rare you get it in the upper. And that pain medication doesn't work now. That is a pretty good sign that you have an ostitis or a dry socket. In those situations, we need to put a medicated dressing in those sites to soothe it. It is the only thing that will relieve the discomfort. Therefore, you would have to call the office and the service will get a hold of Dr. Lannis or I and we will make a determination whether that's the appropriate treatment approach. Medications. We usually will give you printed prescriptions, uh, a blue a uh, watermark script is usually an indication of a controlled drug. That basically is the one that uh, will be your pain reliever. And you may have a antibiotic, which we generally will give for any surgery to prevent any post-op infections. And in certain cases, we will give anti-swelling. Uh, we will give a prescription for a medicinal mouth rinse and possibly even a salve that we will uh, uh, dispense here at the office as an antioxidant that also speeds up the healing. Those are all case-by-case -case basis, but the most common two medications that you will always get will be an antibiotic and a pain reliever. At the follow-up appointment, five to seven days after the surgery, my staff will evaluate the uh, progress of your healing uh, at the surgical site. Usually Dr. Landis and I will step in, evaluate, and answer any questions or concerns at that point. The ladies will also show those patients that have lower extractions where it is applicable how to use an irrigating syringe that will dispense at that appointment. I highly encourage you to be uh, filled with lukewarm water about halfway so you can handle it in one hand and they will show you how to position it to properly flush the surgical site so food doesn't collect in the lower extraction sites. Upper sites we do not worry about using a syringe because again it's all gravitational. This syringe would probably be used twice a day for the next week or two until you notice no food coming out of the flushed socket. After that, I suggest you put it away for a couple of days, then try it again. If no food comes out, you're done using it. If there's still some residual debris in there, then use it alternating until again you notice no food. I hope this review of the written instructions assists in your overall post-operative care. We here at the, uh, Dr. Barsavian and Dr. Landis' office really hope our patients have an uneventful recovery, and we wish for the best. If you have any questions or concerns, please not hesitate to call us, and we will review your concerns. Thank you very much.